Well, thanks very much for organising these. As I as I said in my emails from Toby, I think it's really a fantastic community effort and really appreciated by so many people. Um, uh, what was I going to say? Um, now, there's there's sort of two two generic things that I wanted to um, get across in this this seminar. It's you know it's purposely designed to be a little bit provocative, maybe to get you thinking and to raise perhaps more questions than I'm actually going to answer um, in some aspects of what I'm going to present. And the other thing is that it's a bit of a sales pitch too. I'm, I'm going to introduce an approach and a technique that uh, I suspect most of you aren't that familiar with and um, possibly are quite sceptical of. I mean, I was both of those before I I had to use the approach in anger um, in a project we were involved in where we, we had to do a, um, a risk assessment. And um, I, I was sort of forced to, to find an approach that, that was appropriate for that problem. Um, and so I, I want to introduce you to the approach and, and I'll, this, this talk is kind of in two halves, talking a little bit about the uncertainties um, around ice sheet projections. And in the second part is the approach that we used and, and how it can tackle some of those uncertainties. And the first thing I want to do is introduce what I mean by epistemic uncertainty. Um, and uh, I thought I'd start with Donald. Uh, now, uh, this could be a, like one of many Donalds. Um, it's <laughs> not perhaps the first one that comes to mind, but it is actually one of, I mean, almost equally controversial Donalds. Um, it's not Donald Trump, it's actually Donald Rumsfeld, who... Um, I'll be honest with you, you know, I, 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 sh I probably share, uh, I mean, he died recently, but I share no political views or, 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 or outlook with whatsoever. Um, and Donald Rumsfeld was uh, sort of famous, infamous perhaps, for some of the pretty outlandish comments and statements that um, he used to make. And there are many, many in, in the media that you can find, you know, some of his quotes are really quite bizarre. And this, many thought, was one of them. And I will read it out, um, uh, so you don't have to read it yourself. Uh, um, uh, yeah, so I'll ask, there are knowns. There are things we know that we know. There are known unknowns. That's to say, there are things that we now know we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. There are things that we do not know we don't know. So when we do the best we can and we pull all this information together, we then say, well, that's basically what we see as a situation. That's really only the known knowns and the known unknowns. And each year we discover a few more of those unknown unknowns. Now, when he made that statement at, I think, the White House press conference, he was um, sort of fairly lambasted, actually. And, and a lot of people, um, certainly the media, thought it was almost complete nonsense. But actually, it is um, one of the very few, perhaps the only theory, the thing I can agree with him on in terms of um, a, an accurate description of epistemic uncertainty. And the, the two aspects of epistemic uncertainty are the known unknowns and, and the unknown uncertainties. And I think it's actually a reasonable description of what epistemic uncertainty is. And just as an analogy, um, if you think of um, the pandemic now, we um, in the UK, um, the, the most common um, mutation is what's called the, the Delta mutation or the Delta variant. Um, when that first emerged, that um, was a variant that, that we knew existed, but we knew very little about it. We knew very little about it, its mortality um, or its morbidity uh, figures. We knew very little about its infection rates, um, almost nothing. Nonetheless, we still have to, we still have to ha find some way of modelling um, the, the growth of the pandemic in the UK over time, given that we know that that, that variant exists. So that is a known unknown. An unknown unknown, using the same analogy, is um, not a new variant, it's a new disease altogether, one that we've never discovered. Someone digs up a woolly mammoth in Siberia that's been stuck there for 20,000 years and releases some virus that you know nobody knew existed, uh, we've never seen before. That is an unknown unknown. And we uh, one thing we can be fairly certain of, that in certainly in most environmental systems that we, we look at, we try to model uh, any, any part of the Earth system, there are unknown unknowns. Things that we, you know, surprises. 
Um, so that's really what I mean by epistemic uncertainty. And this is this figure um, is from a, a, actually a nice paper looking at the different types of uncertainty in GCMs, general circulation model, climate models. Um, and it's, it, it, it explores um, what I would say are the conventional, in inverted commas, um, uncertainties that are associated with um, deterministic modeling. Um, and oh, let me turn, um, yeah, let me use a laser pointer. Um, the first two, initial conditions, um, that's, that's um, related to internal variability in the system and climate forcing, that's, that's, that's your, your external forcing. So those are sort of, if like, outside of the model itself. Um, those are how, how the model is conditioned or how it's forced. And the second two here are related to the, the characteristics of the model itself. Parametric uncertainty relates to um, uh, variables, parameters in the model itself that, that are tunable and need to be tuned because some of them, for example, will not have a real physical meaning. They, they are just there to represent some process, but they don't actually mean anything themselves. And then there's uh, this fourth one is structural uncertainty, which is meant to represent differences between models, perhaps in the physics that's used between models or, or how that physics is um, actually encapsulated in, in code or numerically or whatever. So those are the four kind of classes of uncertainty that are typically um, considered in um, deterministic modeling. And on the right, these right panels, I mean, you don't need to sort of look at the details. Let's, let's take the bottom ones. These are uh, CMIP6, the most recent um, climate model projections. And these three colors represent those different classes of uncertainty that I've de described on the left there. Um, the orange is, if you like, the initial conditions, that's the internal variability in the system. Um, the green here is the forcing, the climate forcing, and the blue, uh, encapsulates both parametric and, and structural uncertainty. That's your model. And what's interesting about this graph is that, um, this graphic is that you can see that internal variability as time goes by becomes insignificant. It's quite large at the start of, you know, because that's basically weather. The weather is averaged out over time over, just, let's say, 30 years and becomes relatively unimportant. What grows with time is the uncertainty around the climate forcing and that, that competes with model uncertainty, which decreases with time as um, the, the forcing grows. And, and that's, that's generally um, the, the, the kind of perceived wisdom, if you like, about um, the, how um, uncertainties develop in time um, and compete with each other um, in, in, in actually not just climate modeling, but in other types of modeling as well. But I think, um, there is, I, I'm not saying that that's wrong, of course that's part of the uncertainty, but there's an elephant in the room, um, which I don't think any of those, those four classes of uncertainty actually uh, encapsulate. And these are just two examples. Um, this first one is just a, a paper I'm familiar with, um, a PhD student of mine, Stefan Hofer wrote. And what's, what's, what I find incredible, what's really interesting about this, is just the difference in the way cloud microphysics is, um, so you could say that this is um, structural uncertainty if you like, um, how the cloud microphysics between two GCS, GCMs is incorporated in those GCMs has a bigger effect on um, melt in Greenland than the difference between um, a, a very moderate uh, climate forcing, RCP 2.5, and the most extreme, RCP 8.5. Just the cloud microphysics. And there are many other processes that are, are very poorly known, poorly parameterized between models. Um, I'd also point you to this um, nice uh, kind of discussion paper, um, which I think is also designed to sort of provoke, um, you know, questions and a, a debate within the community, which which is currently in review in um, the Cryosphere discussions, um, which also addresses some of these issues around what's missing in our um, estimates of uncertainty um, when we're, we're trying to um, project parts of the climate system. And one of the key points that I want to make here is that if you're involved in risk analysis and you're trying to provide information for practitioners and policy, then ignoring epistemic uncertainty is a very dangerous path to take. And a little bit fun here, um, a sort of experiment, I thought I'd 
um, get some um, audience participation here. Um, on the left is if you just you can do it on your phone or your laptop or whatever, slido.com, um, and you type in this code. You can I just just out of curiosity, I'd like to see you can use this QR code as well if you want with your phone. Um, see, um, get a, little, a quick vote on this question here, which is: Is the oh are the mass loss trends in West Antarctica over the last two decades due predominantly to external forcing or internal variability? Um, so, if you just want to. Um, tap in what you think your answer is to that and it's obviously not entirely one or other so the key keyword there is predominantly um, and those those trends over the last two decades I'm talking about what we've seen from um, satellite observations particularly in Amundsen Sea embayment that's really what I'm, I'm focusing on there is that is that internal variables in the ice sheet climate system or is it external forcing in other words anthropogenic oh this is this is this is really interesting actually we we are almost totally split now this is just a bit of fun i'm 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 not saying you know you you may not feel that you're necessarily you have the expertise to answer that question i'm not going to use this in anger it's just a bit of fun to sort of see what sort of we've got uh, almost 30 votes there And I would say that is, I, I, I'm going to come on to this again in a minute, but that is super interesting, that result. I, I would class, all right, you know, 46, 54, we only need one more vote and it will probably be roughly equal. I would say that's pretty much, okay, edging towards external forcing, but, you know, very much split. Okay, fascinating. Okay, good, good. Uh, I'll come back to that in a minute. One more question then. Um, you can stay on the same, it's on the same code, you don't have to change anything. Um, it should pop up on your phone or a laptop or whatever. If we fail to meet the Paris Agreement target at 2 degrees by 2100, in other words, if we overshoot, will that result in greater mass loss from the East Antarctic ice sheet by 2100? This is, this is just like, I mean, I, I kind of, you know, I do this, like with some of my undergraduates, a bit of fun, but it, it, it you know, you're a much more informed audience, of course, and so it's, it's kind of just really interesting for me to see. Right. Wow. It's, it's okay. okay. So, I mean, sort of inching towards yes, but the unsures are almost the same and the no a bit less. Okay. Okay. So, I would say kind of slightly tilting towards yes but uh, a lot of uncertainty there as well right okay that is that is fascinating um this is what cmip the cmip6 simulations uh, say about the first question that is um will the antarctic ice sheet contribute more or less to sea level as temperature increases now the details don't matter um this is this is part of a, a slightly different project to do with um, what's called the transient sea level sensitivity to temperature. So on the x-axis, we have the mean temperature change over the next century, over the 21st century. And we have what's called DSDT, the change in contribution to sea level in meters per century. So, you know, up to five centimeters here. So the numbers are small, but SSP, um, uh, 19 or, or yeah, 19 is is um, strong mitigation. So that's the, the coolest. And, and, and basically the storyline here is that um, as the uh, temperature goes up, the contribution of the East Antarctic ice sheet goes down. In fact, it, it um, in some simulations, it's negative. Um, it, it gains mass. Um, and this is from results, this is taking data from Tamsin Edwards' um, emulator results that she published in Nature recently. Um, so the models are telling us that um, the answer to that question is no. That's, that's what they're suggesting. But 
if we look at the models in a little bit of detail, um, this is from Helene's, well, the community um, uh, paper in, in TC, the ISMEP 6 paper on the Antarctic ice sheet um, contribution to sea level over the next century. Um, on the right here, we've got lots of different climate forcing. These are different GCMs on the right. And this is for one model. And you can see, I mean, for East Antarctica at least, well, I wouldn't like to say what the response is. You know, it's all over the place. There's no, there's no, I think that there's a little point in actually in taking what's called the ensemble mean of this because, you know, I mean, it's, it's strongly positive, strongly negative, everything in between. The models aren't agreeing with each other whatsoever. If we look at um, what the models say for East Antarctica, so now we have the same forcing, but lots of different um, ice sheet models on, on the right. These are all the ice sheet models. Uh, this is the SMB con contribution in diamonds. This is the, the total contribution. Um, and again, it's the same story. Um, I, I don't know. I think, I think our quick poll, which, was, which concluded that we don't really know, is reflected in these, these model results, actually. And it's a pretty important question. East Antarctic ice sheet is 10 times bigger than any other ice mass on the planet or holds more ice, you know, 10 times more ice. And, um, and yet we, we, we don't currently seem to be in a very good position to be able to see, say what it might do over the next century. So that's, that's, that's one issue. Um, so I think, you know, the models themselves are, are pretty hard to interpret how, how you would produce, if you like, um, what you might call a consensus, es consensus estimate of, of um, ice sheet projections for East Antarctica from those results is, I, I really don't know. I, you know, I, I, would, I would struggle to do that in, in a scientifically justifiable way. So what do paleo um, and um, recent uh, historic satellite observations tell us about ice sheet mass changes? Um, so this is a plot that many of you are familiar with. I just have to recount a, a really quick story, actually. I was at a, a workshop um, on, on high-end sea level projections um, and Richard Alley was there. And um, he was giving this talk where he was showing all these satellite images of like ice sheet behavior. And I was showing all these plots of sort of paleo proxies, squiggly lines. And I, it felt like there was a complete role reversal that we'd sort of morphed into the opposite of each other because um, I should have been doing satellites and he should be doing squiggly lines. But anyway, I'm going to carry on with squiggly lines just for a few minutes. Um, not that, you know, I would class myself as an expert on paleo proxies, but this, this record, let's look at the one at the bottom, this um, record and let, we, we should go from right to left here because we're starting at 500,000 years BP going to the present day. This is paleo sea level record. And the key point to notice about this is we've got five glacial interglacial cycles here. Um, an interglacial is represented when sea level is roughly close to um, present day value of naught and the minima when it reaches about 130 meters below present day um, is when we have a glacial maximum. So what you can see is that you go from an interglacial where sea level is close to present day and you, over about 100,000 years, you gradually um, lower sea level to its minima. Uh, in other words, and, and, this, this, and, and then you have a rapid increase in sea level going from uh, LGM here, glacial maximum, to interglacial conditions. So it's like a, a sort of pattern that you see, and it's repeated for all five interglacials. What this is telling us is that ice sheets grow really very slowly in fact you know um temperatures cooled um at the start of, of well let's say the last glacial here um about 130,000 years ago um and the ice sheets very slowly over best part of 100,000 years gradually increased in volume but they disappear very rapidly you go from completely from lgm to interglacial in the space of about 20,000 years, actually a bit less than that. Uh, so one thing that that's telling us is that, um, you know, it's, it's easy to, um, it's, it's, it's quite easy to get rid of an ice sheet. It's quite hard to bring it back again. If we just zoom in 
on that paleo sea level record and look at last 24,000 years. So that's from LGM um, at about 23,000 years BP up to 8,000 years BP when, when um, sea level roughly stabilized. Um, and we look at the mean rate when deglaciation really started at about 16,000 years BP. The mean rate of sea level rise um, over that period is about a centimeter a year. That's about three times faster than the present day value. It's, but it's not, you know, it's not orders of magnitude larger. It's, it's more, but you know, it's, it's the sort of rates that um, some models are projecting or, or some, some estimates are projecting towards the end of the century. However, at uh, about uh, 15,000, 15,500 years BP, there was an event called Meltwater Pulse 1A, um, which lasted somewhere between three and 400 years. And the rate of sea level rise during that period was about four centimeters a year. That's four meters a century. So what that tells us is that the ice sheets, because this, 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 all of this acceleration in sea level rise was coming from one or more ice sheets, uh, almost certainly from the Laurentide covering North America, but quite possibly from the Eurasian and um, Antarctic ice sheet in part. Um, there's an open debate about exactly where the source of this came from. But what that tells us is that ice sheets can do pretty dramatic things. We know from the paleo record that they have instabilities that can result in what you might call sensational rates of sea level rise. So that's the paleo record. What about the satellite record? Well, these are um, uh, satellite observations starting, I mean, the high quality observations starting around 1992 up to the present day. And you can see this is Greenland on the left, Antarctica on the right, not quite so dramatic. Um, these plots are um, cumulative mass anomalies. And I, I mean, I've, I've plotted mass imbalance in, in the same way myself, but they are a little bit misleading because um, a, a cumulative anomaly is an integral. And so what you're doing there is you're averaging out all, all the variability. And you can't actually see when um, rates stabilize for short periods um, because it's all integrated out. So if we actually look at what the annual or the interannual variability in the mass balance for those, well, for the three ice sheets, um, was over that period. This is what it looks like. So the blue is East Antarctica, no real trend for East Antarctica. Red is West, where you, you could, if you, if you fitted a, uh, let's say, a running five year running mean through that, you would get a, uh, a sort of almost linear increasing trend. And green is um, for Greenland. And again, you'd get a linear trend. I, I mean, this is not entirely fair to show that there's very large interannual inter variability. There is but that's mainly driven by surface mass balance. If I just plotted the ice dynamic signal, it would be relatively smooth and it would be increasing over time for both West and East Antarctica, uh, West and Antarctica and Greenland. So those are the satellite observations, but, but the question we have to know about those, for them to be useful in informing, testing and calibrating numerical models is, are these trends that we see in, in the recent observations, are they due to external forcing or internal variability? Or, um, they're almost certainly some combination of the two, but, but what proportion of the two? And if we don't know the answer to that question, um, it's very difficult to use these to either test or, or even to um, initialize um, uh, ice sheet models with, because um, it's the difference between, if you like, weather forecasting and uh, climate. Um, and, and, you know, those, those numerical weather prediction and climate modeling are two very different problems. This is what a group of experts, 23 um, experts, uh, thought the answer to that question was. So for Greenland, IV stands for internal variability, EF, external forcing. For Greenland, almost, the experts felt it was almost certainly due to external forcing. But just like uh, you guys, um, your answer, um, the, the jury is out on whether um, the West Antarctic, the, those observations I just showed you are due to IV or EF. Um, you know, you can look at the literature and, and, and that's what the experts have done. 
Um, and really, we don't know the answer to that question for West Antarctica. Uh, an, an additional problem for um, deterministic modeling is that all three ice sheets have um, some form of instability in them. So MISI stands for marine ice sheet instability, which, which also exists for some basins in East Antarctica, um, but is predominantly associated with the West Antarctic ice sheet. MICI is the marine ice cliff instability, which affects both West and East Antarctica. And there's something called the small ice cap instability in Greenland, which is when the surface elevation um, um, decreases due to melting mass loss, um, the, the temperature of the surface goes up and that uh, introduces more melt. And you, you pass a, a threshold where the surface mass balance of the ice sheet becomes negative and it's no longer sustainable. It's no longer a viable ice sheet. You, you are year on year going to have more mass loss. So there are three instabilities, and, and this figure is just meant to illustrate that the, these are, well, this, this is actually a stable system, but these four plots here indicate different types of threshold behavior, where the potential energy to move this ball from one state to the next state is very different. These potential wells have very different characteristics, as do the nature of the, um, the new stable state. And the point about that is that these thresholds that exist in all three ice sheets are very likely both rate and state dependent. And we don't know really where those thresholds lie in parameter space. And that is a really profound challenge um, for deterministic modeling. So um, let me see, how am I doing time-wise? Yeah, not too bad, I think. So, so those are some of the issues and some of, some of the reasons why um, it's, it's, you know, we're deterministic modeling of the ice sheets is, is, is still really a, a major challenge. Um, the normal scientific process, you make some observations, you develop some theory, you create a model, you make projections. And we've done that. We've done that with ice sheet modeling and they are informed by observations and theory and so on. However, um, I hope I've demonstrated that, you know, in this case, our observations are sparse. What I mean by that is sparse in time, sparse in space. They, they don't sample the full behavior of the ice sheets. So they're sparse in that sense, or if you like, incomplete. And our models are also incomplete and ambiguous, as I, I hope I've illustrated with that, those examples of East Antarctica, for example. So if that's the case, this normal scientific process doesn't work. You know, it's not really effective not for risk assessment and you know for policy decision making um, so what are the alternatives well there are there are probabilistic approaches like like the one that chris little um has, has worked on that he, he published a paper on that in PNAS a few years ago and has um published some more recent papers using probabilistic approach but those probabilistic approaches are conditioned on our observations and so if our observations are not fully exploring the the complete behavior of the system, then they suffer the same problems that, that the models do themselves and the same sort of problem that the emulator that, that was used in Townsend Edwards paper, for example. The emulator can only emulate what the ice sheet models are producing. Um, yeah, I mentioned um, Andy's paper as well, which um, uh, sort of talks about a, a, a possible approach, a kind of Bayesian update approach to the problem um, using observations, which I, I encourage you to have a read of that and comment on if you want to. Um, there is a, a, what you might call a plausibility approach, the one that Tad Pfeffer, for example, um, used in his paper in 2008, um, where he, he basically, the, in inverted commas, said, what's the worst, the absolute worst that we think the ice sheets can do? If we just like turn everything up by a factor 10 in terms of dynamics, what are we gonna get? Um, and that's okay, that gives you some, some kind of upper bound, but with absolutely no information about the likelihood of that. Um, so, you know, um, okay, um, uh, Tad's papers or his estimates sort of suggested that you couldn't get more than two meters by the end of the century, but, but how does a practitioner use that information if they have no idea whether that, for the probability of two meters is, one in 10 to the minus 10 or one in 10 to the minus three. It's actually, 
you know, it's very difficult for them to use. Um, and then another approach, one which um, I, I've, I've been working on with the co-authors that were listed on, on my um, title slide, um, is to use something called structured expert judgment, which I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about now, um, because I suspect that um, most of you um, on this on this call um, are not familiar with it and don't really know what it is. And, and so I will spend a few minutes explaining what it is. So what is it? Um, and, and why why use structured expert judgment? Well, um, mathematical theory, and there's a lot of um, uh, psychology um, papers, you know, quality papers out there that demonstrate that, that the human brain is, is actually very good at complex Bayesian inference. And what do I mean by Bayesian inference? Well, this is where the football analogy comes in, um, for better or for worse. Um, so if we go back a few, a few weeks, and, and this is probably more, more appropriate for the Europeans on the call, um, uh, England, uh, in the, uh, not in the knockout stages, but in the group stages of Euro 2020, England played Scotland. Now, Scotland ranked very low in, in terms of their sort of international rankings, and it was a draw. Now, based on that, you, you, would, you, you could make some sort of probabil probabilistic estimate of how likely you thought England would be to get through to the finals of Euro 2020. And I suspect you, you put quite a low probability on it, you know, poor performance. They, they, they couldn't even be, you know, one of the weakest teams in, in the entire competition. But what about if you go forward just a few days when they played Ukraine and they won 4-0? So now you have an additional piece of information and you can, uh, you can generate what's called a conditional probability. That is, you, you condition your prior probability on that new piece of information and you come up with a new probability. Well, actually, I think that uh, they've got a much better chance of reaching the finals than I originally thought. That is a simple example of Bayesian inference. And it does turn out that actually um, we are very good at a much more complex types of Bayesian inference. And the second point is that um, combining um, experts, combining um, just like you do with GCMs um, or iSheet models, for example, a multi-member ensemble, a MME, um, tends to be closer to the true value than a single um, model member. And it's the same with uh, virtual experts or, or experts. Um, and it's important to understand and realize that structured expert judgment, SEJ, it uh, is, is good for identifying the current state of the art uncertainties in a system or problem and, it, and in helping quantify them. It is not a substitute for basic research. It can't tell you what the answer is. It can't tell you, you know, what new piece of science you need to be working on necessarily. Um, and it's particularly good for um, what are called low probability, high impact events or processes. And I think sea level rise um, is, or, or the high end, high end sea level rise, the low probability of, of, you know, let's say partial collapse of West Antarctica, East Antarctica, one of these instabilities being invoked, um, it's, it's ideal for something like that. How does it work? I'll, I'll say, I'll, I'll introduce some of the concepts to you. Um, and a question, a question that I ask, a question that many people ask is, well, look, I mean, isn't it just an opinion poll? You know, you just ask people their opinions or something, and then you just sort of stick them together, don't you? Um, well, no, absolutely not. And I hope to demonstrate why that is not the case. First of all, um, I mean, I will answer this question, but think about it yourselves. You know, what is the difference between an opinion and a judgment? You know, what do you think that, that difference is? My, my view of that is that, um, and, I, and I think this is why it's not an opinion poll. Anyone can have an opinion. You can have, a, anyone can have an opinion on anything. It doesn't have to be informed. The judgment has to be based on you know, an evidence-based um, process where you are using information and uh, resources and intelligence that you have to reach some sort of conclusion they're two very different things uh, one another question that you know is asked of this sort of approach very often and I'm, I'm not an expert on this necessarily but there is a lot of work that's been done on what is an expert and, and you know I, I there's nothing particularly exotic about it but, you know it's basically those people that 
have been working on the problem, have published on the problem, understand it, and have demonstrated that they have an understanding on it through the, 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 the material that they either published or researched. Um, so, you know, in this particular case, it would be people in the ice sheet modeling community, um, or perhaps even in the observational community that have been working on um, paleo and present day observations, for example. Um, an important part of um, what I what we did in, in our studies and, and published in, in a PNAS paper in 2019 is the, the structured element. Well, what do I mean by structured? Well, I'd, I'll explain that in this figure here. Um, so you can think of each expert as, if you like, a, a human version of a numerical model or a GCM, for example. Now, um, different GCMs, different numerical models, have different skill scores. They have different skill at, at answering a particular question. And in some studies, generally not in the IPCC assessment reports, uh, for kind of more for political reasons than scientific ones, they don't tend to weight GCMs based on their ability to reproduce uh, a particular variable. Let's say, for example, we're interested in Arctic surface air temperature. Well, we might actually see how well do the different GCMs reproduce the historical record of Arctic surface air temperature variability. And we could use that as a weighting factor for our GCMs. And we do exactly the same um, through a, a Bayesian update process um, with our experts. We ask them a, a, a series of what are called seed questions. So this is an example of a seed question. What was the 20th century contribution to sea level rise from the combined ice sheets um, over the 20th century? And you know they'll know something about that. They should have some idea what the answer to that question is, but they won't know exactly. And the key thing, the key aspect of uh, the, the calibration of our experts is that we, we elicit a fifth to 95th percentile range. So 5% is, um, you know, we, we think it's very unlikely it's going to be less than this value. You know, it's possible. It's kind of, you know, it's not, I, I would be surprised, but I wouldn't be shocked. You can think of 5% like that. A median, so that's a, the central estimate, and a 95th percentile. So if it was larger than this, I'd be surprised, but I wouldn't be shocked. Um, and an, uh, one of the key things about these, these distributions is that they don't have to be Gaussian. So for, in this example, you can see that the central estimate, the median is, is not, you know, is closer to the 5% than 95. Uh, here, uh, blue represents an elicitation we did in 2010 and red is 2012. And what you can see is that actually um, uh, one of the criticisms of this approach is that it's not reproducible. We demonstrated in this study that it is actually really very reproducible. Um, and what I want to um, uh, point out here is that um, this is the, the range. So this is our uncertainty range for this question and our median estimate uh, for equal weights. That's assuming that everybody has equal skill. And this is our calibrated, our performance weighted solution. And there are two things about this performance weight and, we, uh, and, and the people I've worked with on this, the experts on this approach have done this in many studies. With the performance weighted solution, it, it, is always, it always lies closer to the true value for the seed questions and the uncertainty is always significantly smaller than um, for equal weights. So there are two benefits. You get closer to the target and you reduce your uncertainties by doing this performance weighting. So that's the structure in the SEJ. I think in the interest of time, I'm, no, I, I will really quickly whiz through this. Um, it, uh, ignore, the, ignore the graph on the left, but this one on the right is, um, in one of these structured SEJ um, workshops, uh, my, my colleague, Willie Aspinall, actually asked the experts to give a weight to each other. How, how, brilliant, or not brilliant, that's totally wrong word, but uh, you know, how good an expert do they think um, so-and-so is, this UK overseas consultant. And what was really interesting about this study is that um, it's almost inverted. The, the, the people, uh, the, the mutual weights put expert A as, as you know, the best expert, but when the performance weighting was carried out, this calibration exercise, they came out bottom. And that's quite common. 
um, because, um, well, it's, it's, it, uh, it's explained here. It, that is because the weighting that is generated has nothing to do with, you know, how big your salary is, how knowledgeable you are, um, you know, or, or, or how many papers you've written. It is a measure, and this is the critical thing, it's a measure of how good a judge you are of your, um, of your own uncertainty in something that you know something about, but is in itself uncertain. So it's, it's how confident or overconfident you are as an individual. And, and you can't gain that, actually. And it's, it's very different from those other, other things represented there. So we, we did uh, an SEJ um, exercise um, in 2018-19. We held two workshops, I identical format, um, to sort of capture as much of the intelligence out there as we could. One in Washington, D.C., um, a place called Resources for the Future, another one um, actually very close to Heathrow, to make it convenient, back in the days when people were flying. Um, uh, in, in the UK. Um, and those workshops, um, you know, they, they're two days. The first half of the first day is just spent making sure that everybody is on the same page, that, they, that we all agree on what the problem is and, and that we understand what questions being asked are. So there's no ambiguity and we all understand what we're trying to do. Um, and then it's really intense. You know, it's, it's actually like doing a, an incredibly tough one and a half day exam. And I think this, this photo actually sort of shows that quite nicely. Um, you know, they're working very hard. And the most useful thing you can have in this exercise, as you can see here, is a pencil with a uh, rubber at the end of it. Uh, and I quite like this, this, this photo because I think it illustrates all the emotions that everybody went through, actually, all at the same time. Um, yeah, skeptical, confused, and amused all, all at once. So uh, you know, you get you get the whole gamut. So we 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 did that um, in in um, those two workshops. Uh, we had two different temperature scenarios. One which we call business as usual, which is is uh, uh, pretty close to what you might call RCP eight point five, and this is what we call Paris. So this is two degrees. This is five degrees by twenty one hundred, and we elicited. Um, for each ice sheet for Greenland, West Antarctica and East Antarctica, three processes. How would accumulation, runoff and discharge change at, at 2100, 22 and 2300 um, for these different changes in temperature? That was it. That's all we asked, uh, but that took one and a half days to elicit for the three ice sheets. And th these are the results that we obtained. And um, I'm going to kind of whiz through these um, because I can see I'm sort of getting close to um, time. Um, the, the orange bar, an orange PDF, probability density function, um, is the high temperature scenario and the blue is the low. And let's just look, let's ignore 2050 for now, let's look at 2100. Um, so this is five degrees warming by 2100. And this is the combined sea level contribution. So this, this, this includes now glaciers and thermal expansion of the oceans. Um, or does it? Actually, um, forget that, it doesn't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is just the ice sheets. We added those on to get uh, a total at the end. These are just PDFs of the ice sheets now. Um, and these bars are the, the set, the, the ends are the 5th to 95th percentile range, so that's the 90% credible interval. And these inner bars here, the two inner ones, are the 17th to 83rd. That is the one sigma or the likely range that is, has an up to now been used by the IPCC assessment reports. They have limited their assessment, the contribution of the ice sheets um, to, to um, one sigma or the likely range. And one of the things you can see, I mean, if you, if you look at some of these bars is that I mean, if we take 2300, you know, the likely range, the median's not so far from, you know, from the middle. It looks like it, it sort of could be reasonably Gaussian. If you, if you just sort of snip it off here, yeah, I could believe that's Gaussian. What you're missing is a very long fat tail of 
relatively low probability, but incredibly serious sea level rise estimates that are not implausible. A 5% probability is a one in 20 chance of it happening. And you know, our estimate for 2100 was that there was a 5% probability that combined the ice sheets could con contribute um, uh, 107, about 180 centimeters to sea level. If you add glaciers and thermal expansion, that takes you over two meters. And we could also look at each ice sheet individually. So we could see, you know, what contribution was coming from, from Greenland in green here, West Antarctica, sorry, East Antarctica and West Antarctica. And I'm not going to say too much about that because I want to just spend a minute or two talking about this rather strange looking plot. But this is what we're working on right now for a second paper that is sort of nearly complete, where what we're attempting to do is answer the question is of what processes are driving, what processes are likely responsible for the large, the low probability large sea level rise responses that we're seeing in the ice sheets. And this graph sort of shows it for 2100. These plots are PDFs, but rotated by 90 degrees. So you've got probability on the y-axis now. And on the left, the left hand, we call these violin plots. On the left hand, you've got the low temperature, and on the right, the high temperature scenario. And you've got discharge here, accumulation, which is not that interesting. You can see for East Antarctica, accumulation is likely to be negative. In other words, it's likely to make the ice sheet grow. Um, and then you've got runoff, which is pretty small for Antarctica. But one thing we were very surprised by um, in this study, and one of the interesting outcomes is that, that the two biggest components to the high end uncertainty, to driving the uncertainty in sea level projections um, at the upper end, are um, West Antarctic uh, dynamics and Greenland runoff. Now, you'd like to think that Greenland runoff actually, you know, melting the surface of the ice sheet is fairly well understood. Well, that's true, but there are many things that aren't incorporated in the models, and, and, and that's something we're we'll exploring in um, this paper. This is now uh, the same graphic, uh, the, the rectangles, the black rectangles here are the median estimates, but for 2200. And what's interesting here is that if we look at the high, the high temperature scenario, that's RCP 8.5, remember that's five degrees global, so that's going to be more like eight or nine degrees warming um, in Antarctica and slightly more in the Arctic. You know, we're talking about perhaps 10, 11 degrees warming in the Arctic. Um, um, for 2200 in the high temperature scenario, East Antarctic dynamics be becomes the dominant uncertainty in ice sheet projections, but only for the 22nd century. Uh, I'm going to skip that because um, I haven't looked at it for a while and I can't for the life of me remember what uh, the kurtosis and schooner that the distribution actually tells you, but it does tell you something useful. Um, you just take my word for that. Um, we, we, we also, within those three processes, that is uh, discharge, um, accumulation and runoff, we, we also looked at, we asked the experts some sort of what we call rationale questions. What do we think the the biggest factors are in driving those changes in those three processes. And, and, and these are some examples. Ice shelf buttressing, base attraction, transverse stresses, hydrofractor ice cliff, and so on and so on. Um, and, and we are sort of analyzing those results and coming to some interesting conclusions about uh, what, what are the key processes here that the experts think. And remember, these experts are the people that develop models. You know, these, these are the people that know you know, what processes matter, they really do. Um, and we did the same for surface mass balance. Um, so we had changes in atmospheric moisture or circulation, changes in albedo and sea ice as well. Um, uh, so I kind of whizzed through that, uh, but I think I'm, I'm kind of close to time now. And I just wanted to finish with a, a few take home messages. So I hope I've, I've demonstrated or I've convinced you all that models really can't explore epistemic uncertainty. And that implies that multi-member, uh, multi-model ensembles will always underestimate the true uncertainty in a system. And that um, is a very dangerous thing if you're um, working on risk analysis. 
Um, one of the interesting conclusions is that for the 21st century, Greenland runoff and, and West Antarctic dynamics are the big players, nothing else actually. The other things seem to be really far less important. And I hope that I've shown that SEJ is and can be a powerful tool for understanding uncertainty in hard to model systems. Um, Roger Cook, uh, one of the colleagues who works at Resources of the Future, um, developed the, the approach that we use, and there's a lot more information at his website, lots of examples and tutorials, and free software to use to actually implement the approach. And I will finish there. Um, before that, so that's my last slide. Um, I should say that's not Photoshop, that's a real photo, but it is a stuffed polar bear. It was in the museum in Svalbard, so it's, it's not, no, no hazard involved. No children were at risk from taking that photo. Um, I just uh, wanted to quickly advertise uh, next week's seminar, which is the, oh, it sounds fascinating, um, the role of machine learning in glacial assessment. A really, really topical um, title for next week. Thank you very much, John. Um, we've started to get some questions on the chat. Colin, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Do we have Colin Sayers still here? I can, shall I read his question? I yeah, if he's... Gives a handle on unknown unknowns. If so, how? Yes, I am, absolutely. And um, okay, I, I, I sort of slightly ran out of time. Um, the, the, the reason for showing you, um, for example, the paleo sea level record is that that tells us that, you know, well, you, you know, we, we can argue about semantics, um, that there are unknown unknowns in um, ice sheet model behavior because those those very rapid processes, we're talking very rapid disintegrations of large parts of ice sheets. That was a, on the order of a 15 meter sea level rise in three to 400 years. That's twice the volume of the Greenland ice sheet disappeared in a few hundred years. Um, those processes aren't in ice sheet models. We don't, we don't really know what drove those processes. I would describe those as unknown unknowns. Now, the key thing there is that um, the experts that we were, that we, um, elicit this information, know that. They're familiar with the paleo sea level record. It's, it's very difficult to incorporate that paleo sea level data into an ice sheet model and projections, but it's, it's not so difficult to use it in this, as I mentioned, this kind of neurological Bayesian update. For, for, for I, I, I do that. I have done that myself. I, I'm aware that the ice sheets have instabilities in that we are not properly modeling. And that therefore informs my own uncert my own view about the uncertainties in ice sheet projections. So yes, I am saying that. Does that answer your question, Colin? I can see your your little black box down on the bottom left of my screen. Um, okay, let's move to Trevor. Um, Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for a very fascinating talk. Um, I think you may have answered some of my question, but I'm more interested in the deglaciation in the north after the last LGM. Uh, and my sort of hobby horse is that all the models are wrong for two main reasons. We don't know the thickness of the ice cliff at the continental shelf edge when deglaciation started. Um, and we, we don't seem to model the conversion of ice into water within and above the ice sheet, like superglacial lakes and streams and ice dam lakes, and then the water flowing in, in glacial channels within the ice and along subglacial waterways under the ice. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right, Trevor. Um, I wouldn't disagree with you at all. And I think if we had a better handle, and better understanding of what the processes were, well, both what the magnitude of changes in Northern Hemisphere ice sheets were over time and what the processes driving those changes were, we, we could probably do a, a, well, not probably, we would do a better job in ice sheet projections. So I think it's an important question to address. And I know that many colleagues are working on that. And we've had a, a project in the UK called Brit Ice, um, where, oh, you know, no. a, a, and the idea of that is that, you know, that was a largely marine 
eye-shaped and that if we can reconstruct um, in detail the changes in um, uh, extent of the um, uh, British ice sheet um, as a function of the forcing climate, that will be very helpful in understanding why ice sheets. Yeah, there's some yeah, fantastic papers that. coming out of British ice and undoubtedly it will provide the data. Can I, can I go on to um, be improved? Julia's question? Hi, sure. Um, um, Thank you. Shall, I, shall I read it out, or do you, or do you want to? No, you go. You go ahead. Um, thank you. I enjoyed your talk, and especially like your emphasis on using our own um, our own sense of the data. You know, as a paleo person, I appreciate that um, we have something to bring to the table there. So, in my question that I picked out, maybe one paper in general, but. My general question to you is, I see you smiling, but my general question is um, right, how right. much would those structured ju um, judgments change over time, right? There are a lot of papers per year that come out yeah. and your workshops were two years ago. How much do you think that it would evolve? Um, and again, thank you very I, much. I think that's a great question. And I, I don't know the answer. I think it'd be fantastic to do it again. It's not worth doing these things too often because you know, you're basically using the same experts is a lot of time working. And, and, you know, you don't get an awful lot of extra intelligence out of it. Um, however, um, a couple of points there. So, so the author of both those papers you're referring to was a participant in the workshop. Um, and all, all, I would say all the participants were, um, because at the time that we held those workshops, all the participants were aware that um, Robert's numbers had halved uh, for the twenty for, for the twenty first century at least. Um, okay. but, but you know, I, I mean, it's it's such a fascinating problem because I think mm -hmm. like since since we did that and since Rob's paper came out, uh, Jeremy ba Basis has got a nice paper, you know, like, and there was if you went to Olga's really nice seminar, you know, like Missy is the exception, not the rule. Um, I think you, you know um, these these processes are real. You know, marine ice cliff instability is a real process. It's definitely, you know, the physics is sound. Does it matter? Do we, do, does, does it actually ever happen? We don't know. So uh, I didn't really answer your question, but I mean, I, I, I yeah. <laughs> um, one thing about SEJ is that it, 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 does, it does capture the state of the art at the time you do it. And of course the state of the art changes just like Rob's model numbers change. Or, you, or anyone's, Adam. anyone's actually, not just Rob's, you know. Yeah. Adam. Yes, I, I'm here. <laughs> Adam Kastan in Mont Montreal. Uh, uh, Jonathan, thank you and a great talk. Um, it's uh, my question about uh, an internal variability. At, uh, for, for example, in, you have a thermomechanical feedback in Glacier. We uh, have a different sedimentation condition in uh, large glacial maximum and melt water in different period and different period, different glacier have a different sedimentation condition. Well, for example, uh, how reflect and uh, feedback? This is feedback and uh, stochastic stochastic modeling and, and prob probability. What uh, this is an internal variability in fact. I I um, think I think. Um, you know, there are people working on this. Um, 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 you, understanding what the signature or the time scales, the, the frequency and amplitude of internal variability in the ice sheet climate system is, is a really important question to address. Um, and I, I, I really like, um, there's, uh, Twyla Moon published a paper a few years ago um, looking at changes in ice dynamics of uh, Greenland, uh, glaciers all around the margins of the Greenland ice sheet, that were all experiencing the same external forcing, I mean by sector, but they were all behaving in totally different ways, not totally, but you know, I mean in terms of the marine terminating glaciers, they were responding very differently to the same ocean forcing because of the very local um, boundary conditions, the different bathymetry, the sill in the um, 
the fjord or, or whatever it is, the uh, basal traction or the um, um, basal gradient um, at the grounding line. All of those things were influencing the, the glacier response to the same forcing. And that's, you know, that's very difficult to incorporate in a numerical model in, um, in a sort of um, a complete sense. You know, it's something that really generally has to be parameterized. And I think there are all sorts of the feedbacks like that and um, uh, thermomechanical feedbacks as well. You know, um, um, I, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I, I, I totally agree. <laughs> thank you, John. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Very good, good talk. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Um, Doug, Doug uh, Brinkerhoff. Yeah, sure. Thanks for that great talk. Um, so I guess uh, my, my question relates to this notion of expert solicitation. Um, given that we all sort of read the same papers and uh, utilize models to think about these questions that have similar physics and stuff like that, do you think that uh, this sort of lack of, a, of an IID sample of scientists participating in these things or perspectives, do you think that that has the potential for introducing uh, a, a biased sample or alternatively, do you think that if you were to do this process for everyone in the entire glaciological community, we would converge to the true answer? Um, I, I, there's, there's the sort of possibility that I'm going to contradict myself now, uh, which I do all the time, so it wouldn't be nothing new, but um, I think I, I'm always saying to like my post office things, you can't, you can't invent a signal if it's not there. <laughs> no. Also slightly contradicting myself because I'm sort of arguing that experts can, you know, uh, give you some handle on uncertainty that's not in the models, but that's informed by things that are very difficult to incorporate in models. So I think the knowledge is there, but you can't, you know, so of course there are things that um, the experts and actually the whole glaciological community don't know about. You know, the, the black swans. Like just because you haven't seen a black swan doesn't mean it doesn't exist. So, you know, we don't know. Um, uh, but I think what, what we can achieve by, by doing this, and I think it's, in, uh, I, I didn't really discuss it in detail what an expert is, but I think it's important that um, when you do these, uh, uh, something like the, the exercise we did, that, that you do pick people who understand the, the, the problem and can provide, you know, that ad additional intelligence that you're looking for to it. So I, I'm, I'm not sure how useful it is to ask people that, you know, just have, have never worked on kind of ice sheet processes or, you know, or whatever. Um, I mean, I, um, I, I run a course on structured expert judgment for third years, like it's in a risk analysis course. Um, and, and we do a toy SEJ exercise for the ice sheets. And, you know, I mean, the numbers don't, aren't particularly meaningful, but it's an interesting exercise. And one of the things that actually is quite interesting when you do the calibration is that um, it, it turns out that the calibration is generally somewhat topic independent. In other words, your, how certain you are about something isn't, doesn't necessarily relate to glaciology. It could be, it could relate to football. It could relate to like, oh my, I don't know, you know, whatever it is, the weather or something. Um, it's, it's almost an innate characteristic that you have. You're an overconfident person or an underconfident person, or actually someone that's very good at judging how much they really do understand something. So what, what the, my colleagues who do this all the time have, have discovered is that you can actually do this calibration on, um, experts using questions related to the problem, but that calibration can apply to a whole, you know, to that individual, to all sorts of other things. Not sure if that really answers your question, but, but I think, I think really, um, you know, you're going to get a more informative answer if you ask people who, who understand the problem is the, the short answer. First thing. Mm. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much for this talk. It was really interesting. And um, 
you know, when you mentioned next week's talk about machine learning, and that actually got me thinking, do you think that the approach that you described, do you think it's a little bit like machine learning in a way that you're using all of, you know, a lot of data and, and knowledge, but without pres trying to prescribe the physics to, to make projections? That's Thank. a great question because I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert on machine learning, but it's something mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm sort of getting into. Um, it's a long story, it doesn't matter, but, but uh, involved with some German colleagues with, um, or, or it's to do with Earth observation data. One of the interesting things about EO data is that, you know, um, the satellites now are transmitting um, tens of terabytes a day. Yeah. And you know, there's so there's more information. You just can't process it. So you you need to do something at source. You need to do something where the data resides. And machine learning is a really interesting. But there are different types of machine learning. There is um, so traditional neural network approaches, uh, convolution neural networks, are black boxes. You, you you might get a brilliant result, but you don't know why. And I I I'm not. And actually, I think the community is sort of moving a little bit away from that and are trying to. Uh, move more towards um, uh, what they call explainable machine learning. So that's machine learning with some physics in there or, or so that you understand or you impose some processes. So for example, well, conservation of mass is a classic one. You know, you, you, can't, you can't grow like the earth or shrink it or whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel that that's sort of closer to what we're trying to do um, with this SEJ approach. Um, we, we, in fact, what we're trying to do in our second paper, which we're kind of, is, is, is do that explanation. We're trying to dig into, explore how the experts actually got to the answers they got and what was driving their thinking and, you know, and, and focus on the processes that seem to be producing the biggest uncertainty. And, and we're, we're quite close to that. And, and so I think actually it's, it's more like the explainable approach. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you very much for the talk. Are there any last questions for John? Ah, um, one a comment from Hester or a, a comment and a question from Hester. Um, go ahead, Hester. Hi, Johnson. Really, really great talk. Very interesting. Um, so, my question is, in short, how did you come up with the exact questions and the phrasing of them? Because, as we know, with any questionnaire, whether it's to experts or not, it can bias the answer. So, I, I wonder what the procedure was. Yeah. I mean, in, in the first paper, we, we published the entire questionnaire, everything we asked. And, I mean, it actually took weeks to produce, and you're absolutely right. I mean, look, when I first started, I, I, was, I was pretty... I had all kind of questions I, you know, you, you've got about this and, and I thought, well, you know, it's all ambiguous, it's all, you know, but, but we, we spent a lot of time um, working on the precise wording of the questions. And then as I mentioned, the first half day of, of both the workshops, we're making sure that everybody understands what it is that's being asked and what they have to do. So that so it's absolutely clear. So it's not, it's not like, um, it's not like a little thing you get through the post where you say, you know, tick this box. It's, it's, fair, it's quite labor intensive and it's quite mentally taxing. Um, and the other thing that we, um, I, actually I did it, yeah, and I've done it for all of them, um, is we, we kind of test out the questions on, on people beforehand, you know, do a dry run just to see. And, and, and you know, I, I, my group, I usually send it to my group and say, like, just run this. And, and they often come up with things where I don't really know what you mean by that or this or whatever and so we refine it and refine it but a lot of work goes into the the quest questionnaire itself i mean it's all about preparation really thanks well thank you to everyone and i'll just put uh, hopefully um the um title slide for next week back up on the screen we've got three talks from early career scientists next week. So please come along and support them and come to their talks. And please say a huge thank you to John for his talk tonight, which was uh, really, really interesting, different, provocative. Yeah, different. Lots of those things.
<laughs> Thank you very much indeed, John. Great talk. And uh, see you all uh, next week. Big thanks, John. It was really great. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, thanks for thanks for organising everything, Toby. I mean, like every Wednesday night, you're basically on you. You're sort of like it's your Wednesday sorted for you, isn't it? Exactly. There we go. My social life is sorted on a Wednesday evening. Thanks very much indeed, and see you again. Yeah. Cheers.